So, uh, hey. welcome to a Prep's first celebration of Founders Day. Uh, and so, uh, this is a, you know, our freshman class is the class of 2022, the sesquicentennial class. And uh, so as, as they go along, we kind of keep rolling the drum roll on a little bit about our history and tradition. And uh, happily, uh, I give a presentation on the first Jesuits at prep. And so without any further ado. Okay, thank you. I'll might as well say a prayer from St. Ignatius of Spiritual Exercises. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, grant that all our intentions, actions, and operations may be directed wholly and purely to the praise and service of your divine majesty. We make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, now, this is one of these topics here that I actually, I say humbly, that I know more about this, this whole operation and how it got started than most people will ever know. Uh, but I forgot more about it. You know that expression, I forgot more about it than most people know. And I really have forgotten some of it. But I know the basics. And saying about when the Jesuits came, what we used to talk about were the Jesuit pioneers. But we used to talk about the actual founder as being a John Kelly, who was a diocesan priest and pastor here. Um, and I'll tell you more about him, and very Jesuit connected and all. So, throw out all your categories of thinking in terms of the structures of dioceses, of the Jesuits at the time, and of um, the, the uh, way that things worked in the early uh, times, the, what a school was. Okay, so, St. Peter's, was started as a church, really a mission church, of St. Peter's on Barclay Street, which was the first church in Manhattan, and actually had a Jesuit administrator for a while who was also vicar general, of Father Coleman. But that was well before this. So that's, that was where um, this started from. And the priest used to row, or probably be rowed, over to other mission churches of St. Peter's. Downtown Brooklyn is a St. Peter's church. Up on the hill on Staten Island, just over the ferry, there's a St. Peter's Church. The St. Peter's Church here, which they rode across from St. Peter's Barclay Street. And anybody here from Belleville? St. Peter's Church in Belleville? Yes, sir. That was the other one founded out of St. Peter's Barclay Street. What they did is they get here, and then they go up the Morris Canal to the Hackensack River. And so that was the fifth St. Peter's Church that had the same roof. All right, so St. Peter's Barclay Street was where it started, and that was where St. Peter's <coughs> got its name, not just from uh, the first Pope and uh, the Apostle Peter, but from that parish, which was established kind of as a really Catholic name to make the point on that was the first Pope and what have you. So it was, it was at a time when um, immigrants coming from Ireland hadn't been allowed to be educated in schools there, or for some other parts of Europe as well. So the categories kind of break down a fair bit. All right, the, um, this John Kelly, who I talked about, in Trillick, County uh, Tyrone, uh, he in 1805, he emigrated with his brother, his younger brother, Eugene, um, who became a benefactor and a great friend and probably were from the same well, they were from the same neighborhood as um, Dergajan, John, um, Archbishop Hughes of New York. Okay, um, New York being established, and then he also was in on the founding of Fordham, or what became Fordham, St. John's Seminary, University, what have you. So, anyway, this is this <coughs> group that were uh, that were here. But Kelly uh, became, I think, the fifth pastor here after. Very interesting um, beginnings of his life. The neighborhood around here and the church was being built was allowed, this was like a company town, like you'd have in West Virginia with the coal mines. The company owned all the, the housing and was responsible for all the people and they, they were sort of paid in uh, food stamps basically at the time. Henderson was the name of the company. 
Henderson Street down here. Remember Henderson Street? Now it's Luis Munoz Marine Boulevard. Okay, that was the company. And what they did was they gave a, a plot of land that the people, their workers, and their, the ones who rented from them, um, could build their churches. So the, the grounds along here, there was a ridge, we called it a ridge, but underneath Warren Street where, that, where the, they're parking now, um, that was really swamp coming all the way across uh, uh, Warren. And then there was this rise where that this building, which was the first dedicated school building um, that eventually became all three apostolates, uh, prep and college university, um, was on a bit of a rise. And then there was a stream that runs under what was the grammar school when you were here and also part of the church. And that helped with the second church that caused some problems with that church having to be leveled and this new church that isn't there anymore was built. So you have to sort of picture things. So the plot of land that the Hendersons gave was a ridge that ran from where our Lady Chester Hover Parish is to where the Russian Orthodox Church is to where what is now our Humanities Building, previously the English Building, Freshman Building, the gym, and that lot across that used to be a parking lot, a playground and a parking lot across the street that's now privately built on and all. Um, that was a Methodist church. The, um, where the gym is was, the, it was a touchy situation with the Anglican church, the Episcopal church. They were a bit too good for this. Um, so that the first small building that was on where our gym is now was a congregational church. That didn't last too long. When that, before that first church was completed, mass was said by priests from St. Peter's at the home of the McQuaid family on Sussex Street, um, down by the canal. And those McQuaids were the ancestors of Bishop uh, Bernard McQuaid, who the Jesuit school in Rochester is named after. Another long story. Um, one of the Jesuit pioneers was a McQuaid, I've spent time trying to figure out if they were related, and I haven't been able to do that if anybody wants I haven't been able to do that if anybody wants some research on your own. But McQuaid is also a name from that part in the north of Ireland, that's Tyrone. So same place as Kelly and Hughes. So there was a sort of a um, people understood one another where they came where they came from at that time. Alright, so the first um, church is being built, and because of that swamp, the west wall collapsed into the swamp. So we knew right from the beginning that there were problems. Okay. Now, eventually, um, as you are probably aware, that building uh, became St. Aloysius Academy. The, when we say Kelly was the founder, <laughs> Kelly was uh, born 05, emigrated with his younger brother uh, in 20, and when he was here, he actually entered the Jesuits. Okay. He entered the Jesuits at the novitiate in Frederick, Maryland, which was, that was the only thing we had really for a, a novice ship at the time. And um, there was a church there and also, he entered there. After a year or so, he left for ill health. <coughs> Recovered his health, went out to Mount St. Mary's <laughs> Seminary in western Pennsylvania, which is also where Mother Seton's uh, crowd was from. So he was out there, which is also where Hughes, the eventual Archbishop Hughes, went to seminary uh, from his family living in Pennsylvania. So they were probably connected there. And Bishop Dubois of New York taught them. All right. So he. He enters the Jesuits, he gets sick, um, he joins the diocesan uh, priesthood. Never forgot the Jesuits, and always a big champion of the Jesuits. Um, in the issues over slaveholding, if you remember, Liberia was a country that was founded to send Africans, African slaves, uh, African descended slaves, back to Africa. Right? 
And the main part of it was a Protestant effort. Um, Buchanan's were involved in it. Monroe, Monrovia, Liberia. They were resettling people over there. Now, in Maryland, the, uh, many of the Catholic landowners had slaves. And there was a whole controversy about Jesuits um, divesting themselves, however you want to put it, of slaves. Anyway, at a Baltimore council, you know, Baltimore used to come out with catechisms and stuff like that, but this was like the council of all U.S. church. They decided if these folks were supposed to go back to Africa, we couldn't send them without clergy. So two priests volunteered and a catechist. One of the priests was John Kelly. So he goes over to what is now Maryland County in Liberia. It's the Diocese of Cap Palmas. It's sort of southwest along the coast. Um, but it's definitely clear that it was founded for uh, Catholic former slaves in this new independent country. Well, he's there and not surprisingly gets a, probably malaria. He gets sick while he's there. The other priest who went with him went up to Europe and recruited the French Mission Society, the, the, actually the Spiritans, the Holy Ghost Fathers, came down from France and they came in and they get to Liberia and they're expecting Kelly to kind of break them in. Kelly got on, on the boat that they came on and took off. <laughs> so you don't mention his name with the Spiritan Fathers, the Holy Spirit Fathers. But anyway, coming back, he had a job as a pastor. Then he became pastor of St. Peter's. Now, the church had been built by then. And he did start a school that you might equate to a grammar school. But in our categories now, it was really like a tutoring program. Um, again, this was something that came from Ireland, like the hedgerow teachers, because it was illegal to uh, educate people. And you, um, <clears throat> or sometimes pastors over there, or, or religious orders would educate a few people. Um, but there were no, there were no Catholic schools in Ireland until well after Kelly left, um, until 1836 in Catholic emancipation. So what kind of model were they working on? When Hughes got here, he was a big champion of parochial schools, of Catholic schools. And he actually had an ally, believe it or not, in Governor Seward, who uh, was in Lincoln's cabinet. But so anyway, it's, it's, it's an important issue. Um, but so he started a school, uh, a grammar school, a tutorial program, really, that also included Sunday school type biblical studies and religious studies. Um, so that's why, in a sense, he's the founder. But he is also the one that made a point over and over again, wrote to bishops and Jesuit superiors to have the Jesuits come over and start an educational apostolate here. Um, so that's why he's kind of called the founder. And we used to have a big, actually it was right out here, big portrait of him out here. Um, the 1872, the charter was granted that they could give, basically it was a surprise at the time, that they could give everything that they wanted. But the, the school, he, he got sick again in 66. A Father mm -hmm. Corrigan, who then went to St. Bridget's, uh, was here as pastor. He's officially the one that signed all the documents, handing whatever could be handed over to the Jesuits. The Jesuit who came in the first Jesuit pastor, although he wasn't really pastor, was a Bo, uh, Victor Baudouvin. Um, just technically in canon law um, that's been revised since that a religious order priest can be called a pastor. When a religious order priest came in, he became the, administer, the administrator of the parish. The bishop was really the one that called all shots, right? And that had, had property rights and stuff like that. So. He, Baudivin, Victor Baudivin, was the administrator of the parish, the Jesuit that came. And then eventually another McQuaid, John McQuaid, who was a Jesuit, came over and he became rector and what we would call the first president of um, the college. So we, but as I said, we called them the pioneers. The Jesuits were the pioneers. Kelly was the founder. If you, I don't know. I hope that doesn't get involved uh, 
and too much problem, cause you too many problems with Founders Day and <laughs> fundraising in the, the Suspens and Fenuel or whatever you're having, you know. But that was a little distinction, but you, you get the idea. People were actually working together at the time, which was a little unusual. Right. Now, things changed. New York was archdiocese. Eventually, it became a Newark diocese. The bishop in Newark was Bishop uh, Bailey, who was a relative of Mother Seton. Again, going back to Mount St. Mary's and all sorts of connections there. Bailey was the one that, um, that really signed the documents giving the administration of the parish and the new educational apostolate to the Jesuits. Um, he also, by the way, a little known fact is that the, there was a German Jesuit mission. The Jesuits very briefly were at St. Peter and Paul Parish in Hoboken. Months, you know, <laughs> didn't last too long. But anyway, one, um, one important thing to remember is that this was the Jesuit organization here was not the Maryland province. It was the New York mission, a little lesser, uh, it's not a province, it's a mission. And it was, for a while it was the New York Canada mission. So that a French Canadian like Bonavent would be someone who could easily be missioned to St. Peter's. Um, so everybody was very happy with that. Um, and then McQuaid, John McQuaid came in and um, really started to put the educational piece together. But like I said, it was, it was all, our categories didn't last then. So in one sense, a grammar school already existed with what Kelly had founded. Um, basically at that time, people came to an educational institution with what knowledge they had, and they were brought however far they could go. So it wasn't broken down to first to sixth grade, sixth to twelfth grade, twelfth grade to, it was, it was very fluid. A lot of these situations were fluid. The Jesuits, um, you know, prov provincial situation was fluid. The diocesan issue was fluid. Um, and so things were very fluid. So we, when we say 1872 as the time that the educational apostolate of the Jesuits started here, that is factual and true. So it was founded uh, at that time. But it took a while, probably close to six years, to start taking people in and deciding, breaking out the categories of what they were gonna teach to whom. They had plenty of manpower actually at the time of the Jesuits coming over. And of course they also took care of a number of parish calls uh, around. So they were very welcome in the diocese, at least the, this crowd, not the Germans. <laughs> but the, um, it, it was a thing that had gradually worked out to um, a grammar school the academy or the prep school, and then the um, upper level division. And the upper level, in the 72 grant, they could give any degree they wanted. But the first degrees that they gave were actually in 78, I think. So it wasn't like a four year program that, that happened. And it was minimal people, but then once those degrees, that, which were recognized as state degrees came in, the place flooded with hundreds of students compl compared to dozens. Um, so that's the that's story. Things evolved from there. The, um, the college uh, moved uh, at one point to, I'm not sure if the base of the building is still there, but it was uh, uh, the, cha the, the Chamber of Commerce building, 1 Newark uh, Avenue, down by the Grove Street Station. And then they closed during the First World War and then moved up to uh, where they are now and they become a university now. Um, this building here was the prep um, and that became four, in a, in a sense they did six years, but then it became a four year high school evolved somewhere after that 1878 period. And then the grammar school uh, was um, over the, the building behind us there and that kept on going. So that's basically uh, the story. One, one little item that doesn't relate to founders as such, but I wanna tell you it anyway. You know where St. Aloysius was, right? Um, and the Sisters of Charity. 
Well, of course, they needed priests to teach theology or religion or whatever it was to the young woman over there. Right? But some people say that the first women to teach at PrEP only came here in 1969. Actually, when they didn't have a priest to teach certain subjects like science, like this man did much later on, or foreign languages, the nuns actually came and taught the male students here at St. Peter's Prep uh, as a, a groundbreaking movement that nobody knows about. So that's why, that's why I throw it in there. But let, let me shut up and see if you have any uh, questions along the line. Hi. Well, when did they start um, charging tuition? And when? And, and when? I mean, and how much? Um, they, they started at 78, right? Tuition, by the way, it's only by suffrage. Um, Jesuit schools aren't allowed to charge tuition. Am I right? But they got um, a waiver <laughs> for St. Louis University in um, 18. Anyway, and we're still riding that waiver. Okay. And American <laughs> Jesuit schools, it's only by way of exception mm -hmm. that we're allowed to charge tuition. Um, it was a different, Georgetown was, of course, the first uh, university founded before the, the society was um, um, suppressed uh, and then uh, restored to the Jesuits later on under Bishop Carroll. Uh, or, anyway, it's a little complicated. But they didn't charge tuition. But they had quite a hefty room and board. <laughs> <laughs> and also, one of the things that you might have seen in the papers over the past couple of years, the students could come with their servants. So that's where they got in some of the problem as well on the slavery issue and recognizing what had happened. So just, I don't know if you noticed just even recently um, that they've had uh, um, outreach to those folks who uh, were descended from slaves of the time uh, to help with tuition at Georgetown. So that's that's just another aside. But exactly what the tuition was when the first tu tuition was, was started, it might have been a couple of bucks. <laughs> hey. I understand that uh, Bishop Bailey was very instrumental in trying to get PrEP established. And that I find interesting because that was in the late 1860s and yet Seton Hall had been founded in 1856. Right. So it showed Bailey's dedication to- Oh yeah, very much so. Um, and it was, there was a combination of things I think leading into that. He's also, he was shocked when the other priest didn't want the German Jesuits coming into Hoboken. Because uh -huh. he loved the Jesuits. So I think all sorts of background between his family members and this and that. And, um, Somehow or other, anyway, yes, yeah, Seton Hall had been, had been established um, and after Mother Seton and what have you. But he, he loved the Jesuits for some reason or other. Who knows? You know, I, we have some, some characteristics that people might like. <laughs> uh, Joan Apley, 64. When I was a student here, on my own, I read Will Durant's story of philosophy. Yeah. At the time, there wasn't any discussion about that. Uh -huh. uh, uh, and he was one of the graduates when it was a six-year program. Right. Uh, what is the present view of Will Durant, who, in terms of being a prep graduate? Well, you know who picks up on him a lot more is the university now. Uh -huh. They they promote him um, as this pioneer thinking or whatever, radical thinking, uh, guy who can't happen to come through there, but they, they promote him more than we have at PrEP. As far as I know, who's, who's Ken? Yeah, yeah we have, they, they, they sort of claimed ownership of him. Yeah. And because he also taught there for many years. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I think he did, I, I think he stayed for most of his academic career teaching at the college. So that's why they sort of own it. 
So, so when I was here, we thought the, the really the most famous graduate of prep was Jerry DeFuccio, ah. who, who was an art director for Mad Magazine. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the other guy, you know, the guys who founded uh, what was the what was the sandwich company? Blimpy. Blimpy. Blimpy's, yeah, they graduated from here. Uh, share a story. When I used to read Mad before I came to prep. <laughs> my mother always said, what are you reading that for? That's going to rot your brain. As uh -huh. <laughs> soon as I heard about Jerry, I told my mother, <laughs> he's a graduate of prep, but I was going to prep. <laughs> so she stopped complaining about me reading really bad. Another thing to research, I don't want to go into it now, but when I was president here and I was hitting all you guys up for money, <laughs> um, I researched a lot of things. Was it amazing? With partly his science department, Right, um, well, TV O'Connor's science department, but also going back before that, there are like six or seven really radical scientific discoveries in the area of health that were discovered by graduates of prep. I won't go through all of them. You might want to promote that a little bit. You can you can name them, I know, but it's really it was significant. Yeah. Well, could you speak just a little bit to the Henderson Company? and to the, the demographics of the community and the company town. Right, okay. You got an idea because of the, um, the, there was no Poland at the time, right? But there were Polish people here in numbers already. Um, Poland was divided up, tripartite. Right? So a lady Częstochowa was, you know, that, that was very Polish. But the majority of, of folks were Irish. Um, and it was considered, you know, in a sense, St. Peter's was considered the Irish church. The second church became St. Bridget's, of course, with the Irish stuff, but it was very Irish downtown. The um, Russian Orthodox goes out again, things were fluid. What was called Russian Orthodox now would um, have a whole thing of Byzantine. Ukrainian, Byzantine, um, Slovakian, and what have you. But that was all under, under Moscow at the time and Russian Orthodox. Um, there were, the Brahmins lived up around St. where St. Michael's Parish is now and what have you. So, um, you know, the, the kind of well off people weren't part of this neighborhood. The, um, there were some Methodists. As I said, there was a Methodist church over there. I think they were mainly Scotch and Welsh. And then the congregational, I, you know, I'm not sure exactly what that was, sort of the leftovers if we wanted to go into it. And the work of the Henderson Company was? Um, quarrying and shipping stuff that, on the Morris Canal. But basically it was quarrying. We good for a minute? Did I finish? Perfect. Okay.